Um, good afternoon or good morning or however day of time you're viewing this. Welcome to the COVID Conversations. Um, I am very lucky today um, to have basically jagged this. It's the day before Anzac Day, it's the 24th of April. Um, uh, and through some connections, which I, once you, are, you find out Brisbane is a very small town when it really comes down to it, I'm lucky enough to have on my left or right, Tim Thomas. Tim Thomas is um, these days running a coffee shop but in a previous life, he was in the uh, Australian Army Special Forces and a member of Bravo Company in the Australian Commandos. Um, he did deployments in East Timor and Afghanistan. And since um, exiting the Army, he has um, moved on to do some pretty amazing things um, with the group that he started called Commando in Your Corner and a few other very interesting ventures that we'll talk about more as we go on. But a little bit of background, um, I've known Tim probably for the better part of 20 years here and all there. Um, we were Brisbane, Brisbane Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, Foundation members, I guess you might say. And um, yeah. we've worked out we may have actually competed together at some point. <laughs> but um, enough about me, Tim. It is an honour to have you um, here today. It's, um, as we were talking prior, um, Anzac Day is very important to both of us, but um, I'm very, uh, very happy and very um, honoured that you took time out of your busy schedule with uh, under a day's notice to have a quick chat to me. So thank you, mate. No, Kyle, um, really good to be here. Um, and it's a credit to your, your line of inquiry um, because I think the information we seek is an extension of ourselves, you know, so, so you know, your question really tells me a lot about you as well. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, I've got a good feeling that for the next 40 odd minutes, there's going to be an absolute goal that uh, we can share with others. That's awesome, Tim. Thank you very much, mate. All right, so we'll get on to the barbecue intro. So uh, I'm at a barbecue. I may or may not have a beverage in my hand. I walk up to you, I go, g'day, I'm Kyle. What's your name, mate, and what do you do? Uh, Kyle, my name's Tim Thomas. Uh, the last 10 years, I've been in the veteran recovery space. Uh, before that, I was in the Australian Special Forces Commandos. Um, before that, I was daytime working in retail, nighttime working in the emerging uh, mixed martial arts scene in Brisbane, in Queensland. I think it was one of the few places no rules fighting was legal in Queensland. They had to fly them up from New South Wales. Uh, and uh, we used to have it in biker bars. And uh, back then you could smoke, you know. You were going through to the ring, you know, coughing up a lung, you know. Uh, and the crowd's just these bikers looking tougher than you were. Um, and I was restless. So if we went to ground, people would start to boo, you know. I remember <laughs> one fat biker yelled at me, only gay dogs fight on the ground. <laughs> little did he know this little thing called UFC would emerge, and here we are. UFC brought it mainstream. I always tell my uh, I always tell my students watching that uh, first UFC on video if they know what they even is. Um, and yeah, the, the guy commentating at the time when Hoist Gracie had him in closed guard and was about to break old mate's arm, he's saying he's losing. He's on the bottom. He's getting beat. Little did they know. Little did they know. So you um you do a little bit of uh of uh what a little bit of punching in your underpants, so to speak. You um you work for uh you work in uh for a company called Anset, God bless them. Don't um thank God you didn't work for Virgin as we just said. But then uh something calls you and here you are in the uh in the Australian Army and you go into the commandos. A little bit of insight on that for me, sir. Okay, we joined the commandos for two things. One, uh, the Bali bombings, and I realised that this threat doesn't respect boundaries, okay? Uh, and I also, one thing I'm good at is an amount of instant retrospect. So I realised that my country has this wonderful assumed sense of safety. We just assume when we wake up, there's no one running around with guns, that, you know, we can leave windows unbolted, you know, things like that. And yeah. once assumption gets challenged and shattered, then 
we don't know how to react to that. We're a bit like that kid that was kept too clean as a child, then wakes up, then when it grows up, is allergic to everything. That's yeah. what Australia's threat sense is like. So uh, we don't know how to react to things, so we tend to overreact. Um, and I thought, well, I want to do everything I can to have those unsafe moments overseas uh, because, you know, I think Australia is beautiful. And one thing about beauty is beauty without boundaries can never grow. Okay. Maintaining a boundary is so important to growth. Um, and this is where a lot of people get it wrong with martial arts. Uh, they think it's all about punching and kicking ass, but it's about controlling that space around you so that all those beautiful things inside have a place that can actually grow. Uh, because if, imagine if you couldn't control that space around you, you'd spend all your energy on threats and assessing that. Whereas if you can be confident in knowing that you've got integral boundaries, then you can grow those beautiful things that make you unique. Because you know the, my ability to punch, kick and submit or tap these days uh, isn't what makes me special, you know? the stuff that comes out of me is what makes a person special, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's something that I was willing to fight and die for. Mm -hmm. What, um, so the, so what happened with the Bali bombings? I think that was 2002, I think it was maybe. Early, yeah. Around that. Yeah. Early. Yeah. And again, that was like you said, definitely. And I've, um, I've been to the, uh, to the memorial in, um, in Cuda and it is that reminder like you said, that suddenly we, um, we'd experienced September 11 or we'd watched it on the news, but then we saw it as a people and went, okay, this is starting to get close. So yeah, so um, you joined the commandos. Um, first tour is in East Timor. That's pretty straightforward, I guess, if that's a word for it. Look, I mean, East Timor was, Four months of diarrhea. Without, I'm you, I was eating those, you know, Imodium tablets like your Tic Tacs. <laughs> Here's the thing. They said, go up there, secure the airport. You're coming back within a few hours. Don't pack any sleeping equipment. All right? <laughs> so we get up there, you know, nothing between us and the ground. And we're just sleeping really rough. And we're picking up all these diseases. You know, um, I actually picked up, I don't know how it happened, but I got a, an infection in my pleural cavity. I didn't even know you could, you know, your pleural cavity is space between your diaphragm and your chest. It got in there um, and I thought I was something wrong with my heart, but it got in there and created all this scar tissue and was pressing on my chest and everyone thought it was heart and the, building, the heart was fine, but it was this infection in the pleural cavity because we we're just sleeping in filth, you know? Um, and so pretty much, for, for, for over 15 years, no, for, 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 sorry, for over a decade after that, I couldn't sleep on my left-hand side because of all the, the scarring in the pleural cavity. Uh, and this is just a, a, you know, a small thing that soldiers have to pay for, you know, service to their country. So, you know, you know, yeah, we were over there, we we're maintaining ourselves um, and, and the country's stability. Um, wasn't a particularly interesting or life-threatening you know, experience East Timor, but it was very important we be there and, and create a bit of security in, in our neighbours. So that was where you basically grabbed your legs, I guess, so to speak. But the uh, the real the real test was when you did a deployment in Afghanistan. What timing was that? Uh, that was 2009. Now, in the commandos, you've got a choice of different skill sets. Now, me, I love the water, right? So. Um, I chose amphibious operation as my specialty skill. But you can imagine how useful that was in Afghanistan. <laughs> I was wondering where you were going with that. <laughs> so by the time I got a, a, a gig in Afghanistan, some of my mates who's joined with me had done two or three deployments already, you know? Mm. Um, so I did mine in 2009 um, and uh, we were stationed in Taran Kaup. And I guess what I like about special forces, what I prefer about being in special forces is that we actually look for fights. We don't just wait for something to happen. We we go there and I'd rather I'd rather knock on someone's door than have them knock on mine. Mm. Um, 
And so we were very busy for that time. Uh, we were over there and, um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, real things happened over there that, um, that uh, you know, really questioned your connection to purpose, you know, um, and how deeply connected you were to that purpose determined how far you went, essentially. You know, um, there was plenty of guys in the unit that had, you know, better, more tats than I had and could bench press more than me and looked at me because I looked at me poorly, wouldn't even shake my hand because I couldn't do what they did. But then when shit went down, those guys were hiding behind the vehicles and I'm out the front putting rounds back down range. And it was funny, I was just talking to someone today. You know, our minds are so uh, malleable because I had this negative, you know, energy put towards me saying, oh, you know, your shit, blah, blah, blah. I started to believe it. So, but when Afghanistan happened, I actually did what I was supposed to do. And I saw who could stand up and who fell over. I really realized that, you know, why am I letting other people decide what kind of person I am? And, you know, and this current environment we're in with uh, COVID, you can, you know, the pressure's on and you can really see how people, some people step up and some people, you know, fall over. Um, you know, a small example, I've got this, you know, good karma jar in my coffee shop here at its uh, Eagle Farm Super Butcher in Brisbane. And uh, a guy came in this week, um, a veteran, and um, he wanted to remain anonymous. And he said, listen, if you're there, there I, I know that there are people out there that are hurting. And if you can do something, you should. And if you can do something, it's your duty to do something. And he said, you know, you know, we're struggling right now, but I've got a job. My partner's got a job. Um, so I want to do something for others. And he put several hundred dollars into this jar and said, pay it forward to the nurses, doctors, you know, emergency healthcare workers. Um, and I'm like, wow, you know, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, so just a shout out now for any, um, you know, healthcare workers in the Brisbane area, come down to the coffee shop. You will get free coffee as long as, um, as long as there's credit in this, uh, good karma jar. That's awesome, mate. With, with the military and going back to that sort of thing, I mean, you, I guess it gets dramatized a lot. You read a lot about it. There's a lot of podcasts and YouTube clips and I've got to say, I get, I get sucked into it too. And. It's something that I, I have immense admiration for anyone like yourself that has not only enlisted, but, you know, I don't know if you caught an opportunity, but has been given the right to go and defend their country or defend our values. Is there, was there ever a time, I guess, where you've, you know, and I, by the sounds of it, you've had a couple of instances where you're just there and you go either A, this is fucked, or B, I just want to go home. Like, did you have those moments? Yeah, I'll tell you how that work played out for me, uh, Kyle. We just had a guy blown up, um, and we're going past his body. Well, his body was collected, but past the point where, where it blew up. And, and that's when I had this conversation, like, you know, what freaking difference is a few litres of my blood on the ground going to do for going to change mm. you know what's it going to change in this country this country's been at war forever um it'll make my family sad but, but what else will it do what's one soldier's death in the scheme of things yeah uh, but then i'm thinking if my enemy was watching me right now he would be observing me now they find out very rapidly what you as an enemy are like. Now, my death may not achieve anything, but my willingness to die makes all the difference. And my enemy will figure that out very quickly, how connected to my purpose I am. Mm. So my death may mean nothing, but my willingness to give absolutely everything will make all the difference. And you know what? It would probably reduce the chances of me actually dying too because I'm not operating on a fear base. 
so that was the conversation I had. Uh, and it's basically, you know, it's not until you're prepared to go the whole nine yards that the whole nine yards actually get easier. You know yeah. what I mean? You're not, you're not fighting yourself. You know, it didn't make me bulletproof, but it did give me a higher chance of getting the outcome I wanted. Did you, um, probably the last question before we move on to the next one. Do you, um, like I said, going back to it, was there, I guess, was there moments, like you said, you, you realise your purpose and you realise that it's your attitude that makes the difference, not so much as, like you said, your blood on the ground. Do you, um, if you had a guy walk up to you now and say, a young fella walks in, gets a coffee, you've, you've formed a relationship with him, he says, I want to go into the military because I'd want to go over and do what you did. What would you say to him? Well, I would uh, his actions are an extension of a belief system, okay? And there's a few questions you can ask people to ascertain, is this something that they're connected to or is it something that, well, I, I want to feel good about myself. I want to... Uh, I want to feel like I have a sense of value and I see that this activity will give me that sense of value. Okay. And let me, let me break it down. Like when we're in Afghanistan, we had to find the enemies, what's called the center of gravity, their center of gravity. Cause once you can find that you can off center it. Okay. And then push them in any direction you want to go. All right. It could be as simple as denying them a good night's sleep. Okay, because then they get fatigued and then they're not thinking straight and you can do what you want to do, not what they want to do. They knew our center of gravity was our freedom of movement. So they'd put these bombs in the ground so yeah. we'd be very cautious about where we put our feet. Okay, so one thing I've discovered, Kyle, and this is really important people get this, is us humans, we have a center of gravity and that is our sense of self-worth. Okay. Now, if you can attack someone's center of gravity, attack their sense of self-worth, you can often push them in directions where you want to go. It happens all the time in marketing. You know, see this picture of this happy person? You want to be happy, don't you? Well, you can't be happy because guess what? You didn't know it, but you've got really ugly elbows, okay? And, and you didn't know you had ugly elbows. It's not your fault. But for just $10, I'll send you something that'll fix your ugly elbows. Then you can be like that person, okay? And then they oh, geez, are my elbows ugly? I didn't know that I had to. And now I, I get, I, I, yeah, here, have my money. You know what I mean? Um, so the only way to reverse that out, I found, is investing in that thing that makes you, you, and creating an abundance of it. Okay, operating from a position of strength. Um, basically, that unique energy signature that makes you you gets discovered by treating your own energy like it's money. How you invest it's how you get it back. And it changes from individuals. Now, my energy investment was this path of special forces and I, and I got a big return from that. Okay, but other people might get that return from doing other things. Okay. Um, so what I encourage people to do is, you know, treat your energy like it's a stock market. You know what I mean? Invest in one, see what returns. Okay. You know, you might get a big return from, from grappling. Okay. And it, it's hard to grapple. It takes a lot of energy. It might take a hundred bucks worth of energy, but it gives you like 10,000 bucks back. Okay. Yeah. Um, but someone else might do it and they're like, I don't want to do this. So that to them, it's a waste of energy. So what, really needs to happen is people find out what their unique energy signature is. And it's very simple. Destiny to me is not a mystery. It's a case of seeing the actions that you do or the disciplines that you do that give you a big return. And that some people call it listening to your heart. Me, I'm a bit more logical. What you invest yourself into and how it returns to you. There are actions that give you a big return. There are actions that give you a small return. There are people that take, 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 and there's people that give back to you, okay? Um, so if you lined up your actions and people in your life like a, a spreadsheet of shares that were doing well and doing poorly, how, what choices would you make? Would you choose to fill your life 
full of the investments that are taken from you and you're just pouring a bunch of resources into or the ones that give back to you. Um, because, you know, life is going to have experiences that take from you. But if, you've, if you're doing it from a position of strength, you can negotiate far more effectively. Like if, if, I, if I've only got like a dollar worth of energy and you take 50 cents, then I can't help it but want to claw that back. I'm going to revenge you, Motro, you know. Um, but if let's say I'm in personal abundance and I've got a million dollars, you take 50 cents, I'm like, well, you've just shown your true colours, okay, and you've just missed out on the rest of my life, okay. You can stay here, play with that 50 cents, but I'm moving forward because I'm in touch with something so much bigger than you. Yeah. And so yeah. that's where, you know, we have to be careful how we treat our pain because if we just become defensive, like I'm never going to let that happen again, you'll never ever grow again. No. You develop yourself, become stronger and bigger and stronger by finding out what makes you uniquely you, then you, you really become unstoppable um, because you can't stop other people taking from you, but they can't stop you from strengthening yourself. And, what, and once people figure that out, all your barriers start falling over, all your restrictions. It reminds me a little bit of um, a thing that I've read about courage. And if people who truly display courage, they have to also make themselves vulnerable. So there has to be that element of vulnerability where they need to put themselves out there in order to display true courage. And I'm sure you would have seen elements in your time where there was these people that just showed these amazing amounts of courage and it involved putting themselves out in front of something or between something. And that's, um, that's that point of making themselves really vulnerable. And like you said, finding that, finding that purpose and finding out this is, this is, what, I'm, this is what I'm here to do. Um, so now that I know you, Tim Thomas, what's something you're passionate about? Uh, so <laughs> one of which is um, I like uh, the ocean. Pretty much anything to do with the ocean, but particularly free diving and spear fishing. Um, I can, you know, I'm, I'm not like great at it, but I can comfortably dive down to 20 meters and catch a 20 kilo fish and bring it back to my family and um, share it out with, with my neighbors. Um, and there's two things people can't say no to. Like, you know, often if you offer something to somebody, they go, no, 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 I can't possibly. <laughs> my experience, I'll own this. There's two things people can't say no to. One is a, is a hot beverage. You know? <laughs> I don't know. It's just there's no social filter there, right? A man you after know? my own heart. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm putting down. And then the other thing people can't say no to is fresh fish, as I've discovered. <laughs> I could, I could go to my neighbor and say, look, I've caught some fresh fish. Do you want some? They're like, yeah, boom. You know, this. <laughs> so anything else they might say no to, but fresh fish and a fresh hot beverage. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful activity, uh, spear fishing. Um, it's a physical discipline as well. Um, it's a mental clearing and, um, you know, you get to bring something home at the end of the day and, and, uh, a hot tip for all those, um, new players out there give as much as you can to your partner to then give to her friends okay? <laughs> get, get your partner's friends addicted to fresh fish <laughs> they can say no to you if you ask something but they'll never say no to their friends okay? <laughs> so so get her her friends will be saying hey we need the fresh fish and then she'll kick you out the door to, to go get <laughs> go there you gotta be smart do you, um, do you find that that is, uh, like you said before, like a little bit of the mental, is that, uh, I, I call these sorts of pastimes, your reset button? Is that a little reset button for you? Well, free diving is the only thing that balances out your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, a lot of people don't know it's a hidden human superpower we have that not many people tap into, and that's what's called the mammalian dive reflex so we actually our bodies respond the same to putting our head in water as whales and dolphins it's a whole change of things like 
I could spend 15 years doing yoga and learn how to control my circulation and heart rate, or I could hold my breath, stick my head in a bucket of water and it happens straight away. Okay. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of passionate about is um, Wim Hof breathing, a type of breathing technique. Okay. Mm. And I, these days I probably have one to two ice baths a day. Um, and that's for a number of reasons that, you know, the Chinese for thousands of years have been saying, if you can control your breath, you can control everything. All right. And when you're exposed to that cold, it forces you into that control of your breath or you lose everything. So it really does sort of pressure test um, your breathing and um, it produces what's called killer T cells, which are these really powerful, uh, the body's most powerful antioxidant that soaks up all the free roaming radicals, which, you know, in this time, you know, we have, we, you know, boosting of the immune system is very important. Um, and, you know, obviously I don't recommend anyone just jumping into an ice bath. You start with, you know, at the end of your shower, have a cold shower for 30 seconds and then a minute, and then eventually you get comfortable with that. And then you just have a, a cold bath with a bit of ice and then you slowly, slowly build it up. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned is that, the more gradual you build yourself up, the higher your chances of success, the higher your chance of sticking to it. Because guess what? Um, you can do things that are comfortable and easy a lot longer than you can do things that are uncomfortable and hard. Weird, it's isn't it? Weird. <laughs> adding, adding volume. Um, now, I reckon you've, you've seen and achieved a lot as a lot of people I've spoken to. What is something on your bucket list You've still got a few days left on the roster. I don't like bucket lists only because when I was young, I made this bucket list and unconsciously it was connected to things that created the greatest amount of energy. And the things that created the greatest amount of energy in me were the things I was fearful of, terrified of, okay? And I'd get close to these things and then I realised, oh, they're not that scary you know, or they're not that this, you know, um, they're not as big a deal as I thought. These things that I thought were huge weren't that scary, you know. Um, and it was incredibly um, disappointing and a bit of a letdown. Like, uh, you know, I, I mean, as a kid, I was terrified of sharks um, and I used to wake up screaming. But now I, I swim with sharks, you know, weekly. The other, you know, the other week I'll swim with a great white interacting with it. <laughs> um, and I'm like, this is cool, you know, but it, it, it's almost an anti-climax in the way that you've, you've done those things on your bucket list. And I guess now it's a case of growing your bucket. Um, and, and, and I'm still a bit lost in that space right now, Kyle, like I've made this list, I've done it, but now what the hell, you know, like I know there's, there's more there and I, and there's, there's a, I think that, um, I think there's a, a place in me that, that I'm blind to, that I need to grow. Um, and that means getting out of my comfort zone in other areas, you know, um, because as soon as you regularly get out of your comfort zone, that becomes comfortable. You know what I mean? Um, and I sort of did that in the military, getting outside the physical comfort zone and, and to a point, the emotional comfort zone. Um, you know, never say die, never take a day off. And my mind and body broke as a result. You know, when I got out in 2010, um, I nearly lost everything. And as I slowly started putting myself together, I realized that you know, I'm not the only one going through this. Uh, and I started having these conversations with people and they're like, oh, you too, you too. Um, I guess if, I guess if there was things I'd like to do, I would like to be a, I want to be one of those you know, like when you think of Ayers Rock or the Great Barrier Reef, that goes, that makes me proud to be Australian. Yeah. Okay? I want to be one of those people that, 
that people say, you know what, that guy, that guy makes me proud to be Australian. That's that's my bucket list. That's a very good way of looking at it, mate, because I've, I've asked this question to a few people now and if A, they find it very hard to answer and B, there's people that go, I had stuff on my bucket list and then I did it and I go, well, what do I do now? And I mean, those people who are watching this and that haven't met you before, had anything to do with you, you they would probably go, this guy is probably a little bit on the uh, thrill seeker slash crazy side. I mean, you've fought MMA, you've been in the commandos, you free dive with great white sharks. What, what could this guy possibly have on his bucket list? But you're kind of, I guess, you would, you're letting your bucket list find you because you wouldn't have thought you'd be sitting in this situation 10 years ago, would you? Well, I guess I did all the things I wanted to do sub underneath my skin, I suppose. And now I want to, you know, go past my skin and positively affect other people. Because what I've noticed, Kyle, is there is this small space in front of people inside of every person that if you can touch, it's like the starter motor for the whole engine, okay? Because mm. the starter motor in a car is quite small, but it gets the whole engine going. And if yeah. you can just hit that energy spot, you can then spark off the whole engine and you can create growth and abundance and all these amazing things. Now, the only way I've found to do that effectively is by not inventing stuff, but just explaining what I've discovered, you know? Um, and it might've taken me 10 years to discover it, but now I can go, there it is, can you see it? Oh, yes, I can, you know? And so in that one conversation, you've saved them 10 years of, of looking, you know? Um, so imagine this, and to me, this is the closest thing we have called a, a human superpower. Imagine one conversation with you saving someone 10 whole years of their life. You know what I mean? Because we've only got, what, 80, maybe 100 years. So to me, effective living is, you know, doing it yourself as best as possible, but having these powerful conversations with others where, you know, you say, you, 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 it evolves you, but it helps others evolve as well. You know, there's that great saying, if you can't evolve me, don't involve me. Yeah. You know? it, makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense, mate. And yeah, it's just tapping into what we're truly capable of. I think, um, so, the, so the next thing, and I guess this is something that we spoke about before we started recording, and I think it's a great time to have this conversation. It's Anzac Day tomorrow. So yesterday, uh, sorry, last year, um, I watched the uh, speech on YouTube yesterday. There it is, there it is. I watched the, um, I watched the speech yesterday of you giving a, a beautiful, I don't know if there's any other word to describe it, a beautiful speech um, at the 2019 Anzac Day at um, Greenslopes Private Hospital, which was, you know, in its, in its inception, it was, a, it was a veterans hospital. And that was a, a beautiful speech for you. Um, Anzac Day is obviously going to be a lot different this year. There's the light up your dawn. Um, I know I'll be standing on the driveway tomorrow morning with my family. It's like that thing where, you know, do you need the venue to understand Anzac Day or is it still, it's going to be probably weird or is it going to be just that little bit different but it's still there for you? How does, how does a veteran feel Anzac Day will be in amongst all the COVID stuff? Well, I mean, Anzac Day is a testament that we, no matter who you are, we are made to be connected to other people, you know, and special events aren't meant to be kept to oneself. It's supposed to be multiplied by sharing it with others. Um, and I have a really sort of, it's not as bad as it used to be. Like the week before Anzac Day used to be really tough uh, for me. You know, that, that famous ode, you know, they shall not grow old as we are left to grow old. At the going down of the sun in the morning, we shall remember them lest we forget. I mean, are you kidding me? I'm seeing my dead mates every sunrise and sunset. Man, I, I wanted to forget, you know. You know, but there, therein lies, you know, the tale of, of brokenness and 
the path out. Uh, you know, so these days I, I really enjoy sunrise, sunsets. I'm not seeing the, the, the images of my dead mates, but, but, you know, come Anzac Day, it is rather overwhelming, um, you know, that experience. And, and, and I can only get by when I lean on those people around me. And, and they could be complete strangers, but we're all there in unity, you know, sharing that space. Um, there was, and so, you know, this Anzac Day, I am leaning on some, some good friends to pull me out of my shell because, you know, when we feel something overwhelming, we want to go, stop this, I just want to hide. Um, but I, I literally had people coming out to my coffee shop going, guess what? I'm going to make you bacon and eggs on the driveway. You need to be there. Just to, because they knew I'm like, no, nah, I just want to protect myself, you know, in my, and this is what I've discovered, in, in our isolation, we can self-justify anything. You know, yeah. it doesn't feel anything, but our self-justification makes our pain familiar. You know what I mean? And that makes us feel like we're in control of it. You know? Um, and I've kind of lost my track of thought there, Cole, but, you know, there is a certain heaviness in my heart because it, it is about remembering those people that were closer than brothers, honoring them. And it's almost like, it kind of feels like the things that you've swept under the rug, the pain and sorrow you feel for your brothers, it can get all revealed on that day. You know, you can't sweep it under the rug, you can't ignore it. Um, and, and I think that's why, you know, there are Anzac days where people get where soldier, people get really, really drunk because this big energy comes out and they don't know how to handle it. Um, so it's like they're given a they're given a green light on that one day to grieve, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I am I'm tomorrow I am moving into the unknown. Um, there is a certain pain and heaviness I've got in my heart. Uh, but I know I'll be with one or two other brothers um, and I won't be the only one going through it. Um, and the thing, my sort of, my battle cry has always been to anybody going through anything, it doesn't have to be Anzac Day, but to anybody going through anything, it is how many other people do you think are going through this or have gone through this or will go through this? Mm. So picture those people lining up left and right of you. And there could be thousands. Because if you can find a way forward for you, you are going to be able to find a way forward for them. Okay? And it might take you a week, a year, 10 years, but that's, and, but that's great because that's the amount of time you're going to be able to save others in that one conversation you have with them. Okay? Because all other people need is to know somebody who's done it before and they don't have to like you. In fact, it's better if they don't like you because if you can show them it's possible and they don't like you, that really goes down even deeper because some people go, well, I'll agree with you because I like you. But if, if people genuinely, I'm just getting rid of the idea that you need social approval to uh, be powerful. Um, if people don't like you and you show them it's possible, then they, they bring it on board even deeper. They probably won't vocalize that to you, but people don't realize that your life is bigger than a billboard. You know, people see stuff that's going on, whether you like it or not, you know. So if you can find a way forward for you, then holy shit, there are thousands of people left and right of you that you're going to be affecting. Some you'll know, some will thank you. Some will say, thank God that in 2020, you did this. Yeah. But that's probably only 2% of the bigger picture. Do you... um? So with the COVID stuff going on, and I mean, what you've seen in your time as, a, as an ANZAC, you've served, you have an immense amount of pride for your country. Do you sometimes stop and go, we can get through this? And like, honestly, it's, it's not like anyone's trying to shoot us or lining you up with an RPG. All we got to do is just pull our heads in for a little bit, be a bit sensible. Do you find sometimes when people are chatting to you about how terrible all this is, you go, is it really 
worth kicking up such a stink about, like the stuff you've seen? I'll bring it very, to me, it's uneducated to sell something just to harden up. I mean, there is a time and a place, and that's that's what's made Australia great, the, the ability to harden up. Mm. But I, I like to sort of break it down a bit more in its, in its block form so people actually understand what's going on underneath the surface of your skin. Now, have you ever noticed before you do a workout or run some sort of physical or spiritual discipline, just beforehand, you have these thoughts in your head, in your head going, nah, don't do it, do it tomorrow. You know, let's not do this now. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> that little bit of, oh, you know, because there is a part of you that if you were to step into that empowering space, physical, spiritual discipline, that that negative part of you would die, you know? And just before that negative parts of you die, that disempowered parts of you die, that's when it screams the absolute loudest. It'll scream blue murder just before it dies. You'll say, I'll shut up if you just don't do it. Mm. Okay? So this is what happens just before strength comes out of us. Those parts of us that are going to change or even disappear are the ones creating those doubts, those fears. Because once you really step into that strong space of who you really could be, they're gone. They're history. They don't even exist anymore. So that transitional space, that anxiousness you feel, those negative voices, they're not actually negative voices. You've got to reinterpret them as messengers, very honest messengers. Excuse me a second. <coughs> very honest messages saying you're about to become great you're yeah. about to become powerful because those parts of you that are fearful and creating all that shit that's that's real but it's them saying we're about to die you know something powerful is about to take place um now people can hang on to those things and self-justify and surround themselves with people that say exactly the same things but you're underplaying yourself. You'll never actually step into that greater space, mm. uh, which is amazing, you know? Um, and if you can do it for you, guess what? You'll do it for a lot of other people too. So don't think that it's just you. Life is bigger than a billboard. You stepping up is going to have massive implications on everyone that, that knows you and, and perceives you and then, just being aware of that helps you take that next step. You yeah, know, right. um, I think I wandered a bit there, Kyle. Did I, did I get around to that? <laughs> no, mate, you did. Um, you did get it. I mean, you, you did get it. And I, I think, I guess what you're trying to probably say is that there is just, there's stuff we just need to do. And, you know, if we, like you said before, you know, you were talking about how, how does my blood make any difference to this big picture of this entire battle. It's if our attitude greatness right now. We're in the space before greatness and that's when all the doubts start yelling loudest because they're about to die. So when people are feeling anxious right now, reinterpret that as you are about to become great. Yeah. Okay. There's a bigger energy about to come through and switch all that stuff off. You know, but here's the thing. Our empowerment headspace has a shelf life of 24 to 36 hours. We have to reinvest and reconnect with that pretty much daily. Otherwise, we tend to become energy conserving organisms and then feed into the negative or become too dependent on things outside of us. You know, like, I mean, you know, let's say coffee, right? Um, <laughs> let's say coffee. <laughs> I, I had to have eight a day and, and, and I couldn't function or be even a nice person if I didn't have a coffee. Um, coincidentally, this is turmeric. Um, <laughs> but you see what I mean you know yeah. when you feel that anxiousness inside of you that's greatness about to happen but when you step into greatness then it needs to be done daily otherwise you'll switch you can you know and, and I'll just sort of say this now and um, it's something I talk about in, in this book which we'll talk about maybe later on that there are two completely different types of people in this world and they're both you. There's the you that 
invests in themselves, creates an abundance, knows what they like and, and brings it forward, brings it to them. And then there's the you that doesn't see their value, doesn't know how to invest in their value and sees things outside of them as more important than what's inside of them, okay? Same person, two completely different planets to live on. And we can switch day to day. You know, why? I, it really blew my mind why some days I can feel awesome doing what I need to do and why some days I was completely smashed. And that was because I hadn't invested in the stuff that I thought was important, invested in my physical discipline, spiritual discipline, connection to the things that, that, that were important to me. Yeah, I, 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 mate, I, I totally agree with that. And I think at the current state of the world at the moment, we need to look after ourselves in more ways than one. And like you said, I, I have my, uh, my golden three. It's my sleep, my food, and my exercise is right. Everything yep. is right. If, if, if one of those three is off, everything is off. And I think that's just something we need to focus on. But, um, mate, look, I'll, um, we'll probably wrap it up there. What I will say is probably I speak on behalf of all Australian people. It's an honour to have had and still have people like yourself defending our shores. Um, like I said to you uh, in our earlier conversation, my grandfather fought in World War II in New Guinea lost his uh, right arm as a result. And he, was, he, had, his, he had his stuff in the basement um, when, he was, when he came back. But I do remember, I guess, how proud he was of you know, what he'd done and his medals and his, you know, his, his trophies. He's, he was a boxer in the army. And it was just always, a, it was a, I, I can always imagine how much of a hard day Anzac Day was for him. Um, and like you said, tomorrow is going to be a very different Anzac Day for a lot of you because um, you don't get to do that, that catch up and that, that little thing that you usually do together. And you've just got to make, make do with the best you can for what you have. And I can understand being so, um, your, uh, your experiences will be very raw. So, um, I, uh, I wish you all the best for Anzac Day tomorrow. I know it's going to be a great day no matter what. Just by the sounds of it, you're going to have some people really supporting you. But before we go, there's two things I want to plug. Firstly, Tim runs a very uh, passionate organisation called Commando in Your Corner. Um, Tim, can you give us the 30-second uh, the rundown on what Commando in Your Corner is about? Okay, Commando in Your Corner, a few informational segues, not just for veterans, but civilians. Um, my YouTube channel, if you were to look at only three videos, look at The Secrets of Pain, part one, two, and three. That breaks down a healing journey. It'll bring, it'll save you a decade off your healing journey. Um, and I also do uh, Instagram posts, uh, Commander in Your Corner on Instagram. Uh, I used to run a veteran men's group but COVID sort of shut that down uh, temporarily. Uh, but yeah, Commander in Your Corner is, is my brand that um, seeks to hit that part of a person that just, that just starts the whole engine, you know, um, essentially. And, you know, uh, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And the final thing, you may have seen it in the uh, in the shot. Tim's got a book, um, Fight, Flight, Feel, um, which recollects a lot of his experiences and um, stuff that he's taken away from that. Um, one of which we now all learn that Tim is terrible at growing a beard. Uh, <laughs> but he still makes coffee even when in Afghanistan and has still the original coffee press. Yeah. <laughs> it was making America. coffee whilst fighting the Taliban. <laughs> we got campaign on. We had to can it up. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Yeah, you can't have shiny things in the field. Um, that was awesome, um, Tim. If someone wanted to grab um, a copy of that book or find out more information, what's the best way to do that? Well, that's that's on Amazon, all the different platforms, and audio book as well. Um, but if people come down the coffee shop. Well, where is that again? 
coffee shop is Eagle Farm Super Butcher. Mm -hmm. We're open Monday to Friday, 6 to 11 a.m. So right. for, for 20 bucks, you get a coffee and a book. Um, I'll check if the author's in, he can sign it for you. Um, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> That guy, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, mate, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll include. Um, I'll include. I'll give Kyle a link for the for the for the first the sample of the first chapter audio book. You can click on. Um, fantastic. Also give Kyle the link for the Anzac Day speech last year. Yeah. Um, I'll be I'll be putting that up. It was it was an absolute. It was one of the best Anzac Day speeches ever ever written. And, and I say that because I delivered it but, and, and technically I wrote it, but when I wrote it, there was something coming through me. Um, and so it was like, I wasn't writing it. It was when I was in Afghanistan going into an ambush and I had a genuine interaction with the spirit of the Anzacs and, and that, that changed everything, changed everything to this day. And, 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 I, and when something is genuinely spiritual, it's not just for you, it's for everyone else as well. So. So that's why I'm, I'm unashamedly um, wanting people to, to to take that and and share it amongst everybody because it, what that experience wasn't just for me. Um, I survived that for a reason, um, and that reason, you know, I explain in that in that Anzac Day speech from last year. No, uh, it's it's an amazing speech, and um, yeah, it's something that I um I I took away from that by all means. Um, Tim, thank you very much again. Um, I really appreciate you doing this at short notice. Um, it's good to reconnect with you after all these years. Um, but guys, this will uh, this is will um, you'll be watching this uh, on the twenty fourth of April. Um, so tomorrow being Anzac Day, please um, take a take a moment. Um, I always say to my people when I'm I'm bugging Anzac Day. There is one morning that you maybe got to get up a little bit earlier than you'd like to. This is the one. Um, it's worth doing. Um, 6 a.m., uh, I think the uh, Queensland RSL is telling people to stand on their driveway. Um, if you go to the RSL website, there's information there on how to do it all. But, um, Tim, thank you. Um, it's been an absolute honour. Uh, we'll finish up the interview now. But, mate, thank you again. And I will uh, come and buy a coffee and a book one day soon. Thank you. Oh, my, my absolute Thank Thanks you. very much. Let me just finish this up.